In this sixth video lecture, we will learn about analysis of variance. Analysis of variance is one of the most complex concepts that we're going to be learning about in this video lecture series. However, it is not a huge jump to understand analysis of variance, providing that you already understand how the t-test works. So, let's return to our t-test. Recall our between group design. We had an intervention group which consisted of CBT and a control group which was a waitlist, no CBT, with the dependent variable being depression scores on the Beck depression inventory. Let's say that we wanted to examine three groups rather than just two groups. So now we have a treatment group that lasts for six weeks, a treatment group that lasts for 12 weeks, and a waitlist group that lasts for zero weeks and the dependent variable is depression scores on the Beck depression inventory. If we have more than three groups, statistics gets a little complicated. It all goes back to error rates. You see, with two groups, we can conduct one t-test at 5% risk of error. With three groups, we have to conduct two t-tests to understand if the differences between the two groups are significant. The problem is, conducting multiple t-tests increases the risk of type 1 error exponentially. And remember, type 1 error is to do with a false positive. For example, for six separate t-tests, each carried out at the 5% type 1 error level, the combined use of the t-test can lead to an error of 1 minus 0.95, that's our 5%. And if you inc uh, increase that by the power of 6, because we have 6 separate t-tests, 0.95 times 0.95 times 0.95, etc., 6 times, you get 0 0.26. 0 0.26 is a 26% likelihood of finding error, that your findings would be found by chance alone. That is too high an error rate in statistics. And this is known as a family-wise error rate. You can see from the table to the left that the number of groups, as the number of groups increases, the number of t-tests increases exponentially because with three groups you only need three t-tests, but with four groups you need six, five, ten, six, fifteen. And after a while, if you have, say, six groups, you're running fifteen t-tests, and that can lead to a dramatically large uh, uh, error rate, one that you can't really live with as a researcher. So what do we do about this problem, having a too high p-value? The solution is known as analysis of variance, or ANOVA. To combat this problem, we can conduct one test for multiple groups, known as analysis of variance. This procedure is based on the same ideas as the t-test, but with more than two groups. The graphic to the right helps us understand this, that essentially we're looking at the difference between groups and within groups, so understanding between versus within groups and looking at that variance. Here's another graphic representation of that. You can see there is variation between the groups and also within the groups, and we look at the difference between to within, and that helps us to understand the impact of the groups, whether there is an effect just based on group membership. ANOVA uses the F ratio, which has a different formula to a t-test, but functions similarly in that values are determined by degrees of freedom, which as you recall is influenced by sample size. Simplistically, the F ratio, or the F statistic, is determined by between group variance divided by within group variance. That's a very simplistic version of the actual formula, but it helps us understand how the F ratio works. Here's a basic example of an ANOVA. Let's say, going back to our prior example, we have three groups, CBT 12 weeks, CBT 6 weeks, CBT 0 weeks. That would be our weightless control. So we have people who are randomized into one of those three conditions. The dependent variable is depressive symptoms as measured by the Beck depression inventory. We might expect to see a significant main effect, which basically means a significant F statistic, 
for treatment, meaning there's going to be a difference in terms of the amount of treatment that a person receives. Graphs for the main effect may look like, for example, Beck depression inventory scores being less as the intensity of the treatment increases, meaning you have a higher Beck depression inventory scores, meaning more depression for waitlist than for six weeks of CBT and even less for 12 weeks of CBT. So in other words, there's some kind of an effect of treatment increasing over time, if that makes sense. Repeated measures ANOVA helps us examine the rate of change over time, known as the trajectory of change. This really is the emerging model of research in the counseling field, understanding not only is one therapy more effective than another, but understanding what kinds of rates of change occur. Does a person get well more quickly in one treatment, but then not make much progress after a while, or does another treatment uh, result in slow, gradual, measured progress that results in more progress over time. We want to know those kinds of things, and so repeated measures ANOVA helps us with this. This is an example of repeated measures ANOVA, and this is more complex because when you start adding in multiple conditions, the kinds of, of just research design you have gets more and more complex. So let's say that we have three groups again. This time we have CBT DBT and waitlist control. So instead of having 12 and 6 weeks of CBT in the waitlist, this time we have three different uh, conditions entirely, which is CBT, that's one treatment, DBT, which is similar but a different treatment, and waitlist control. Again, our dependent variable is depressive symptoms. And we add an additional layer, which is that we're going to be collecting data on pre six weeks, 12 weeks, and follow up at 24 weeks. So we're collecting data at different periods and comparing that data with one another. This is known as a three by four design since we have three groups that are being measured at four different times. This is what it would look like just graphically to have a three by four design. You can see on the left uh, rows we have our three treatment types and the uh, columns at the top we have our four periods of data collection. We might expect to find a significant main effect or significant F statistic here for group times time. What this means is there is a difference between groups, so for example we would expect D CBT and DBT to be more effective than a waitlist certainly in regards to time. So we would expect CBT and DBT to have uh, less depressive symptoms in their participants, meaning they reduce depressive symptoms uh, at the follow-up compared to at the pre-measurement. So we would expect both difference in groups and difference in times terms of time. This is what a main effect graph for that kind of interaction uh, might look like. You have on the x-axis pre, mid, post and follow-up that has to do with the time in which data is being collected and you can see in the legend we have CBT, DBT and waitlist. Now looking at that graphic helps us understand why this kind of research is useful because we can tell looking at this just the lines on the graph that waitlist really doesn't result in any measured change over time, that's the red line the blue line, DBT, results in faster change, no, I'm sorry, less fast change, more measured change, but change that results in the end at lower BDI scores than any of the three conditions. It's the most effective over time. Whereas CBT results in quicker gains than DBT, but plateaus faster, so it does not result in as uh, much uh, progress as DBT, for example. So main effect graphs are quite useful in psychotherapy, particularly to understand what's going on over time as the client progresses. This is how the statistic would look in a uh, ANOVA design. You have an F statistic and then degrees of freedom reported after that in the brackets, that, and we'll explain what that means in a moment, equals 8.89 there's a p-value of less than 0.05. You still have p-values for f-statistics. 
uh, probability values. And then we have what's called eta squared equals 0.12. Eta squared is the effect size. So essentially we have an F ratio and then 2 and 86. So what does that mean? Well, this is the degrees of freedom, the numbers in the brackets. The first number relates to the number of groups or means and the second number relates to the size of the sample. That isn't exact in terms of how the numbers add up, but that's what they represent. There's some statistics involved, but that's what they overall represent. And then we have the actual F statistic, which is 8.89, and that is significant at the 0 0.05 level, meaning unlikely to happen by chance alone, with only 5% likelihood of, of it just being found by chance alone. So that's excellent. And then we have our eta squared, or effect size, of 0.12. And if you've done a little bit of research in terms of what that means, that is a quite large sized effect. Remember that different effect sizes mean different things depending on the statistics. So for a, a D statistic, 0.12 wouldn't mean very much. It's quite small. But for eta squared, 0.12 is quite large. So you need to understand those parameters when you're analyzing effect size. As with the t-test, remember, sample size matters, though again, less, I should actually add this, less so than f compared to t. With t-test, sample size really does um, uh, influence how significant your finding is going to be, whereas with the f ratio, that is not always the case. You can still have a significant finding even with a small sample size, and that's because it has more what's called statistical power, the F ratio does. I'm not going to explain exactly why that is or what that involves at this point in time, but just know that sample size affects the F ratio less than with the T statistic. The F ratio compares means across more than two groups and tells us whether there are significant differences between the groups. That's useful. We want to know, okay, is there something going on in terms of, in our prior example, the different treatment modalities in terms of time, what happens over time. However, the F ratio is not the end of the line. It's not the last statistical test that we use, and that's because it doesn't tell us where those differences are. For example, if we know that CBT for of 12 weeks is significantly different from a wait list, but not from CBT of 6 weeks, we would want to know that. The F ratio is not going to tell us that. It doesn't tell us where the differences are. For example, we don't know if the CBT 12 weeks is bigger than, C than the wait list, or CBT 6 weeks, or if CBT 6 weeks is bigger than the wait list but not 12 weeks. It doesn't tell us which of those groups is different from one another. All that it tells us is that somewhere in that hodgepodge there's a difference. Now that's particularly important when you have large designs like 3x4 designs like we saw earlier where you have a lot of different groups that can be compared with one another. So a significant difference somewhere within those groups really doesn't mean very much at all because there could be a lot of different ways in which those groups could interact to find a significant difference. So in other words, all that you know from the F ratio is that there's a difference somewhere, there's a needle in that haystack somewhere, but you still have to find where the needle is. The F ratio is useful because it allows us to find that information out early before we start doing multiple t-tests and increasing our error rates. So how do we find that needle in the haystack? How do we find out where the actual differences are in that hodgepodge? To find which groups are different from one another, we have to run what are called either planned comparisons or post hoc tests. Planned comparisons are a priori comparisons of certain groups. For example, CBT of 12 weeks versus a waitlist. A priori means we decide before we conduct the study what kinds of comparisons we're going to do. So I may, for example, think to myself, I really want to know if CBT of 12 weeks is different from a waitlist. I may even look at some of my basic descriptive statistics that has to do with mean and standard deviation, uh, maybe some of my graphing to determine where I think the differences might be, and then I'd run the statistics. Those are still planned comparisons. Even Sometimes you can do planned comparisons even after you have the data. You don't necessarily have to decide it before you get the data. But the important thing is, is that you decide before you run the statistic itself 
before you run the plan comparison where you're going to be analyzing so you're not just doing multiple multiple t-tests without direction the flip side to this the multiple directions the multiple t-tests without direction they're known as post hoc tests these are comparisons of certain groups after the fact and this can be data mining if the researcher isn't careful so for example with pre-test and post-test groups in the 3 by 4 design above if you compared every single group with each other that would be 69 different comparisons I did the math and you don't want to be doing that because that would be horrendous for your error rates but still with post hoc tests you do tend to be computing more t-tests than you would with a planned comparison and so the rate of error is going to be higher now I gotta tell you there is a way to cheat at statistics and his name is Bonferroni there was a famous statistician called Bonferroni who developed something called the Bonferroni adjustment and this is essentially if you're going to be using what are known as post hoc tests instead of planned comparisons post hoc tests use the Bonferroni adjustment to minimize this inflated error rate and they do this by a lot of how can I say it nicely statistical maneuvering in order to reduce the rate of uh, error and I'll be honest with you it doesn't sit well with me but it's commonly used in statistics and so if you see the Bonferroni adjustment just know that they are statistically adjusting for the probability of error which is uh, in my mind kind of cheating at statistics really so do we need another test sorry ANOVA and post hoc tests are useful though they don't tell us about differences in growth curves and therefore we still need information about which clients get better the speed at which clients get better and when a plateau effect occurs in other words the graphing for ANOVA looking at those main effect graphs are very useful at looking at growth rates but the statistics themselves don't tell us really about the growth rates for that we need something called multi-level modeling multi-level modeling uses things like beta st statistics looking at basically rise over run also known as regression um, it's very similar to the idea of correlation you're basically looking at what happens over time where does the line fall in terms of the trend line and we kind of get a sense for um, the rate in which change occurs using multi-level modeling in ways that we can't with ANOVA and so a lot of the research studies that are now coming out tend to use uh, multi-level modeling and B statistics or beta statistics rather than the F statistic however the beta or, be uh, or B statistic is uh, more commonly understood through correlation and regression and so we'll learn about that in another video lecture for now we've just learned about analysis of variance and how that works and that concludes this video lecture